Welcome to the Bar Band Podcast, where we talk to the smartest athletes, coaches, and minds from around the world of strength. I'm your host, David Thomas Tao, and this podcast is presented by Barband.com. Today's episode is a bit different than most we've done, and we're focusing specifically on news that has rocked the world of international weightlifting. My guest today is Phil Andrews, CEO of USA Weightlifting, who is also acting in a temporary role with the International Weightlifting Federation. We'll get to that in a second. In early 2020, a German documentary titled Secret Doping, The Lord of the Lifters premiered, which made some explosive allegations regarding the International Weightlifting Federation's governance under Dr. Tomas Ion of Hungary. Ion served as Secretary General of the IWF from 1975 to 2000 and as President of the IWF from 2000 to 2020. The documentary alleged systematic financial, election, and doping fraud perpetrated by Ion and his co-conspirators. As a result of the documentary, he stepped down as president, and Professor Richard McLaren was tasked with investigating the allegations. You may recognize his name from previous doping investigations at the international level. This is roughly the time that Phil Andrews was approached to take a temporary role in the governance of the IWF. On June 4th, McLaren's findings were published, and the investigation concluded that over $10 million was unaccounted for, with no paper trail to determine where money that was withdrawn by ION was spent or if it was used for legitimate purposes. The report also concluded that ION interfered with IWF board elections via bribery. The report did, however, effectively clear Hunado, the Hungarian anti-doping group, of wrongdoing that was originally alleged in the German documentary. That's worth stating here. In today's episode, recorded just a day after McLaren's report was published, Phil Andrews gives his thoughts on the initial impact on the sport of weightlifting at the highest levels. We also discuss changes in Olympic qualifying procedures for the Tokyo Olympics. Now let's get to it. Phil Andrews, thank you for joining me today. This is actually the third time you've been on the Barbed Podcast, which is a new Barbed Podcast record. Oh, wow. uh, the, yeah, the, well, so it's it's like Tom Hanks hosting Saturday Night Live in many ways. <laughs> I'll take that comparison. Uh, I think anyone would, uh, but right. <laughs> but the circumstances uh, that we're chatting under today are a little different uh, than normal. This isn't kind of a check in on the state of affairs of USA weightlifting. This is actually no. very much a check in on the state of affairs and some very recent news in in one of your several roles. Now you're kind of serving as a double <laughs> role. Uh, we're going to be talking about the McLaren report, which came yes. out. Uh, came out recently and uh, uncovered or confirmed some some widespread corruption in the International Weightlifting Federation. But for context and before we dive into that, give people a little insight into what exactly you're doing with the International Weightlifting Federation right now and, and the timeline there, because I think that's pretty important to realize that you're not just the CEO of USA Weightlifting now. You're, no. actually, you're actually acting in an organizational role at the International Weightlifting Federation. Yeah, so I'm currently in an interim staff leadership role with the, the IWF, um, which has started only, only in the last couple of weeks. Um, that primary role is to oversee the transition uh, to have the operation based out of Switzerland uh, and to find a new permanent, and it will be a chief executive officer rather than a director general, uh, CEO of the, the IWF. I will not be standing uh, for that role. Uh, that was my choice and, and part of um, my agreement with the IWF. Um, I do want to be part of Team USA at the 2021 Olympic Games. Um, and uh, to be honest, I don't think I'm the right person for that role right now. Um, so, um, I'll be helping them identify who that person might be. And, uh, there's a search committee made up of executive board members, which I'm supporting, assisting, advising, um, in that search, uh, to, to find someone permanently to lead the, the IWF staff, uh, based out of, of Lausanne, Switzerland, which for those who don't know is the, the Colorado Springs of, of the worldwide Olympic movement. It's where the IOC is based. It's where the International University Sports Association is based, etc. So uh, we're plowing along with that. Um, obviously, that role may chop and change a little bit as we go along here. Um, we expect that to last about three months, but it could be a little bit longer based upon how long it takes us to obviously react to yesterday's news, uh, but also to identify the right employees uh, to assist us with this one. And if- I, for some additional context here, it seems that two 
members of the governance of USA Weightlifting are now leading the IWF, yourself and uh, and Ursula, who is yeah. uh, who who is heading up everything right now uh, in in her in her role. Um, the interesting thing about that is it looked very different than at the beginning of this year, and. You know, there was a a pretty gr- groundbreaking, uh, explosive. Some people have called it German documentary, Lord of the Lifters, that alleged widespread uh, and systematic corruption in the International Weightlifting Federation uh, from uh, the person and team who had been leading that organization for nearly forty years. So, give us a timeline as to when exactly you were approached about taking a leadership role in the IWF as Dr. Uh, Ajahn was basically phased out? Uh, in terms of the staff role, um, I believe it was it was around April. So it is around when Ta- uh, to Dr. Tamash Ayan, um resigned his presidency. Um, and I was appointed a- around that same time. And I apologize that I have an exact date for you, David, but uh, that discussion has happened for a while now mm-hmm. uh, and came to fruition and since. I, and, and before that, I was acting as secretary to the IWF's Oversight and Integrity Commission, which was set up in January um, on a voluntary basis um, to, to support their work in identifying a uh, investigatory team to, to look into those allegations you mentioned. And of course, Richard McLaren was the, the individual that we appointed to lead that or the IWF's executive board, advised by the OIC, uh, appointed to take care of that investigation. And I was acting as the, if you like, support to that group um, throughout that process. Um, so I've been a little bit involved in this whole thing since January, uh, although the official role of the IWF has only recently started um, in, in May. And when we hear, we're going to talk about the McLaren report, which came yeah. out on June 4th. Uh, so a few days before this podcast is is airing. And we hear the, the McLaren report. It seems like every time there's an Olympic sports scandal uh, in a broad proportion or in a broad sense, we hear the word, uh, we hear the word McLaren. And it, who is Professor McLaren? And why do you, did, why was he put or asked to be placed in this role as the investigator of these allegations specifically? Uh, Richard McLaren is is best known for his work in uh, with WADA. Uh, He was the uh, person who led the the primary two reports into the uh, and since it's under appeal, I should say alleged um, issues with Rosada or the Russian anti-doping agency. and uh, that's why the McLaren report or that sort of phrase seems very familiar to everybody. Mm-hmm. Uh, previous to that, Richard has been involved for a long time in, in sports corruption, in anti-doping or rather doping investigations, and, and perhaps most notably as uh, heading the, for many years, and I think is now heading it again, the uh, Basketball Integrity Unit worldwide uh, for FIBA, which is the IWF of basketball. Um, he's got a long history of, of that sort of practice um, in, in Canada. And it's probably the best known worldwide. I think what stands him apart is he's really nobody's friend. Mm. Um, he's not going to write um, anything that he doesn't believe in, and he's not going to write anything that you want him to. Um, he's, he's doesn't, you know, even with WADA, there was items where he disagreed with WADA. Um, it, despite publicly perhaps uh, there might be a perception that he's you know water's guy because he did those reports and that's true he did those reports but there was items where he disagreed with water mm-hmm. so items where he disagreed with the IOC and I think what stood him apart is is his reputation yes but that reputation is built on the, he his a report from Richard McLaren will be respected by people like the IOC the ITA WADA and um, and I think the majority of readers but not necessarily friendly to those organizations. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think that's critical to be respected, but not a friend. And I think that's, that's where Richard is. He wasn't the only person that was looked at. There's others who have conducted investigations or uh, ethics or uh, compliance investigations into these sorts of international federations. Um, Perhaps both notably recently, the international biathlon union. Mm -hmm. Um, And so, you know, there was a look taken, I think four different groups in the end uh, that could do the work. 
uh, and Richard was selected by a majority vote of the executive board and a unanimous vote of the Oversight and Integrity Commission. So how long did Richard McLaren's report take to compile and how long did his investigation take in the context of the look into the allegations against the IWF governance? So it was originally a 90-day period and that was due to end, I think it was April 22nd, um, and that got extended through to June 4th, uh, which obviously occurred, and that was due to the coronavirus, mm-hmm. uh, which did significantly hamper the, the ability for the, the investigatory team to you know, get things like in-person testimony, et cetera. Um, that was the, the time denoted by the executive board in January. Um, that is for an investigation of this size and scope. That's actually a pretty quick timeline. It seems, um, it seems aggressive to, for this yeah. level of detail. Yeah. I mean, McLaren 1 in the WADA cases was also roughly the same, but there was a McLaren 2 in the WADA cases, which is the better, generally viewed as the better known report than the more detailed report uh, into the, the, the Russian uh, doping scandal. Um, but yes, the 90 days for, for this level of inquiry or this scope of inquiry is reasonably quick. Um, and obviously, a, a, an additional time would have helped that some. Uh, but the coronavirus probably balances that out, if not perhaps a, a net negative. Mm-hmm. And we'll dive into, I mean, in the show notes, in the YouTube description for the corresponding video for this interview and the article we write around it, we'll include a direct link to McLaren's full report, which it has a, a fairly succinct, and I say succinct in the context of a, of a very long document with a lot of research behind it, a fairly succinct executive summary that readers can look into. And if they want to go into more detail, there's a, a detailed table of contents and you can really dive into it. There's, it, It's more than a light afternoon read. Let's put it that it way. Is. So we're going to include that in the show notes and in the description for, for people to reference specifically. But how large something that it doesn't jump off the page. How large was McLaren's investigative team? And do you have a sense of how many uh, people they sought testimony from? Uh, I don't know the exact amount of people they sought testimony from. Uh, I know that, and this is mentioned in the report, there was some disappointment on their part in the lack of people who came forward or the relative lack of people who came forward. Um, they, they do mention witnesses, anonymous witnesses, by a number. I believe that number is randomly drawn rather than chronological. So just mm-hmm. because you see witness 904 doesn't mean it was 904 witnesses. That was something um, that took me a second to kind of to kind of wrap my head around for yeah when, when, me too. when reading yeah. Uh, and so Richard's team was primarily made up of of three lead individuals: Steve Berryman, who's best known for his investigation into FIFA's finances. Uh, who's an American uh, former IRS agent, um, a gentleman named Martin Dubby uh, out of Britain, who was the lead investigator. Um, his uh, background was the, he used to be the head of the Serious Organized Crime Unit for Great Britain, um, and then Richard himself. And below that, there was uh, assistant investigators, for example, uh, you have forensic accounting individuals, forensic IT individuals, and, and uh, assistant investigators to, to Martin Richard and, and Steve, primarily Martin, um, who were involved in, in acquiring that evidence and analyzing that evidence. You're in an interesting position because you are very much dealing with the impact of this report as someone who has, is basically wearing a lot of hats in the weightlifting community, both domestically in the United States and abroad. Um, there's a lot of fallout from this that you will have to sort through representing two different uh, but interconnected organizations. Something that is worth noting is during the investigative period and, and while this report was being compiled, you were not you did not have access. You were not looking over anyone's Ooh. shoulder. And I think it is important to note that you found out about this and read the ultimate report at the same time everyone else did. I mean, there was basically a, a media call where the report was effectively released. We can kind of nickel and dime the exact minutes of that. Um, but you're finding out about this kind of in real time along with everyone else, just to confirm that's correct. Yeah, so we were due to get the report, uh, we meaning the uh, IWF, executive board, the IWF's Oversight and Integrity Commission, uh, myself as their secretary and the secretariat, which is the IWF staff, was supposed to receive the report around 7.45 a.m. Mountain Time, which is about 15 minutes ahead of the uh, the media press conference from Richard. It actually did come in about two minutes after eight, so two minutes after the due start of the press conference, right when Richard started speaking, we received the PDF. 
So I think that was the exact same time as the media. Um, and of course, you know, if we're listening, you know, I, me personally, I'm obviously not in the same building as anybody else right now, but you know, I'm reading through this at the same time Richard's speaking uh, through his remarks and notes. And of course, some of that's relevant because you want to hear his opinion and his uh, remarks as well as read the document. But I didn't have a chance to read the full document uh, you know, word for word until yesterday afternoon. Uh, after both that press conference and the press conference uh, that uh, was held by uh, Ursula Pavandrea on behalf of the IDGRF's Oversight and Integrity Commission about two hours later. Um, I skimmed read it, obviously, uh, and read the executive summary that you mentioned, um, but I didn't uh, have a chance to sit down and actually read it until, you, until the afternoon. And, and I say yesterday, this is being recorded on, on June 5th. Yesterday was June 4th when the report was published. So... The report was looking into a, a, a it's it's difficult to actually sum it up in a few sentences, a broad spectrum, let's call it, of corruption allegations, including significant financial corruption, including election fraud in the context of IWF elections, and also uh, doping fraud uh, and, and mishandling of, of doping. And one thing that is worth noting is you, you talk about <clears throat> McLaren not necessarily being anyone's friend. There was no... Things were not confirmed across the board. Let's put it that way. All the allegations made in the Lord of the Lifters documentary, many of them were supported by McLaren's, the McLaren team's ultimate findings. Some actually weren't. It was not a kind of a f- across the board, like, hey, everything that was alleged did occur. However, we should start right at the top. Widespread financial corruption and election fraud perpetrated by the high, at the highest levels of the International Weightlifting Federation. Walk us through, in your perspective, uh, what this report actually found and confirmed on those two ends. Yeah, I, I think it's, it's, it, you're correct. I, I think we should probably open with one that the, uh, the one allegation that the McLaren report categorically found that was not accurate, which was Hunada. Um, the, the allegation was Hunada, the Hungarian National Anti-Doping Agency, um, had uh, colluded or cooperated in some way uh, with Dr. Tamashayan and the IWF uh, to manipulate doping samples. Um, and uh, Professor McLaren and his team found that to not be accurate and that they were acting within the wider code. And I think it's really important where there's a allegation that's disproven that we emphasize that. Uh, so that's one thing. Um, you know, the, the report obviously goes into significant detail um, and finds about $10 million roughly uh, missing uh, from IWF monies. Um, it, it is not clear how much of that is in direct um, cash fraud and how much of that is in extremely poor accounting. Um, those are both mentioned. Um, we've already in the IWF's operation uh, changed the way that we uh, look after our bank accounts. Uh, there are bank accounts that were uncovered uh, that I mentioned in the report. Um, those are now being accounted for uh, and when necessary, either signatories changed or being closed. Um, we've appointed a company out of Switzerland, the IWF Operations has, um, to assist us with uh, essentially getting our, our house in order when it comes to accounting um, and getting our um our books into the place where they need to be as an operational business, quite frankly. Uh, And obviously, whilst we must maintain a bank account in Hungary for now, whilst we still have staff there, then eventually those accounts will transfer into Switzerland, uh, where the IDRS registered seat is and its permanent home will be. So there, it's still unclear, even after the report, it's still unclear exactly how much money was funneled away from the IWF to the personal benefit uh, of, of Dr. Ion and any potential collaborators he Correct. had. Is there any chance that the IWF gets a portion of that money back? I think it's a difficult question to answer, David, right now. Um, I think that you know depends on what happens next. Is there um, any um, proceedings in Hungary or in Switzerland uh, against Dr. Ayan or any other individual uh, with respect to the financial fraud. And that will be a decision for, for law enforcement in those countries. Um, the Is it possible that, um, that Dr. Ayan may say, yes, now I've been, you know, now the report said this, I will come forward. Um, a report inside the game yesterday suggests that's not going to be the case. Um, so it, it, I think that's a, 
I honestly don't have a good answer for that. I mm-hmm. wish I could say yes. And, you know, here's how we can, we, reco- we can recover, you know, one, two, three, four, ten million, 10 million, whatever it is. But I think there's a reality to that depends on what the legal process that, that Dr. Ayan may or may not face from this day forward uh, might look like. And I think that's primarily going to come down to uh, the legal structures in Switzerland and Hungary. I think something that's worth getting a little bit of a handle on for folks who might not be intimately familiar with it. Well, first off, uh, how exactly does the IWF make money and where does that money go? A lot of those questions, no one besides Dr. Ion seemed to have uh, the answer to as far as where that money goes for a number of, of decades. And I think this report uncovering a very tangled web of finances, um, some poten- some intentionally fraudulent, some maybe not intentionally fraudulent, just sloppy bookkeeping, uh, still a lot to be worked out. But for context, for folks who might not be familiar, how does the IWF make money? So about 53% of IWF funds come from the International Olympic Committee. So that's monies that are received from the IOC, primarily for TV rights to the Olympic Games, uh, but also from uh, top sponsorship, which uh, you know is people like Visa um, or Toyota, et cetera. And that money feeds down into the international federations and national Olympic committees, according to a tier, in the case of the, the international federations, according to a tiered system. Um, the IWF receive a significant amount of money, and that's why the revenue of the IWF is significantly higher in an Olympic year than is the other three. The other income looks primarily like rights fees uh, for hosting world championships, um, media from those world championships, sponsors uh, from those world championships. There's also small items like membership fees um, from the worldwide federations, uh, smaller items like uh, referee cards, which are $200 uh, per card. Uh, so, you know, if you think about in the U.S., we have it's about 80 roughly now. Um, I don't have category ones and two. So that's, uh, you know, by the time that all adds up, that's another healthy income stream. Right. But it, it, the, the biggest single revenue driver for the for the IWF is, of course, the Olympic Games. And, of course, that's been a challenge this year because we expected an Olympic Games, therefore payments be received um, uh, around about now, but also later in the year from the Olympic Games, uh, and they'll be received next year. Um, the IWF does have a good reserve, which is uh, good news that uh, it can survive off of that reserve and has not had to take additional funding from the IOC uh, in order to survive, which some other sports have uh, had to ask for that advance. Um, that money should be received next year with, with no problems. Um, and therefore, you know, well, whilst those um, those additional practices are put in place, and they have to be, they're already being worked on. Then, in terms of getting the books up to date, in terms of getting the books in shape from here on forth, um, then uh, that money hitting next year may, in in a way, be a good thing because hopefully we've got the books and the accounts into a, a working order by that point. Dr. Ayan was at the at was leading the IWF for uh, around 40 years. I actually think it might have been a tick over 40 40 years. It was a long period of governance and the corruption and allegations that were looked into from the McLaren report are relatively recent. Let's let's put it that way in the context of of Dr. Ayan's governance. Is there evidence that suggests that Dr. Ayan had been using IWF accounts as call it a personal piggy bank for decades before these uh, the allegations outlined in, in the report? I think it's difficult to say there's evidence to support that, David. I mean, you can see what the report says, and you could certainly make up your own assumptions mm-hmm. or mind or what may or may not have happened before that. Mm-hmm. Um, but specifically, and due to time primarily, and due to you know, records not being available necessarily for the 70s, 80s, 90s, uh, and, and perhaps even the OOs, the, the McLaren report really looked at 09 to 19, mm-hmm. that period of time. Um, is there a chance that similar allegations or similar issues may have been brought up if the report looked at uh, 1970, question mark, when uh, uh, Dr. Ayan was first elected to the executive board and subsequently as the uh, general secretary um, and then president in 2000? Yes. Uh, I mean, I think that's certainly something that you could read the report and perhaps bring your own conclusion on, well, if it was the case in 2009 to 19, based upon what I'm reading, 
is there a strong chance it might have been before that? And you can draw your own conclusion. Certainly not, not trying to entrap you to, to say anything uh, specific on those uh, on that, that you might not know, but is there, um, we talk about in the WADA case, there was a McLaren report one, and then there was a McLaren report two, McLaren report yeah. part two kind of being the one that is, is much more widely known and kind of came to be so known as the McLaren report in the context of, Professor McLaren's work with the IWF, is there going to be a follow-up or is this report, the one that came out June 4th, kind of the end of his engagement with the IWF looking into these specific allegations? Potentially so. Um, I don't necessarily know that it'll be McLaren that will be engaged to mm-hmm. do that um, because now we've got allegations that are have, have some evidence being presented. Um, and therefore, it's up to the IWF uh, executive board um, who, who are still the governing group, or the Congress, which does stand above um, the executive board, to decide what the next steps are. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and those steps will be critical in rebuilding our sport and the reputation of our sport going forward, um, and what those investigation or disciplinary or reform steps look like. McLaren certainly made some uh, recommendations, some of which required further investigation, and some of which uh, simply require implementation, some of which require a little bit of both. Um, And uh, I think that's a place to start, uh, where Richard, having investigated uh, these matters for several months, has said, well, having looked at this pretty strongly, this is what I think. I think that provides a guide for the the IWF EB. Um, With some allegations made against executive board members, it certainly seems like an appropriate action might look like some further independent involvement, uh, but that will be a matter for the executive board itself to look at. Let's shift a little bit and focus on some of the other allegations that the McLaren report did confirm, and those were in relation to uh, election fraud um, yep. at, at the at the IWF level. Um, now, this is something where uh, it's especially touchy subject because on the financial corruption, the report basically said, look, things were so complex and so hidden and tiered that Dr. Ion was really the only one. He set it up such that he was the only one who knew what was going on with the true finances of the IWF. Yeah. Uh, it's something that we're still uncovering. Election fraud, in this instance, takes a significant number and investment by co-conspirators. And so let's talk a little bit about that, which election fraud allegations were confirmed by McLaren's report, and what are next steps, as you know right now, from by the IWF uh, in relation to those? So let's do the next steps first. You know, bear in mind where the next day, we don't know that yet. Mm-hmm. Um, and that will be up to the EB uh, and somewhat the Oversight and Integrity Commission to, to look at what those might look like. I apologize for my text tone. Um, the, those steps probably do look like some sort of independence, of course, from the executive board in, in terms of those discussions. Um, or investigations, but that is up to them to decide, uh, not for me to decide or for even for us on our own to decide. Um, in terms of the vote buying allegations, it's alleged in the report that in both 2013 in Moscow and in 2017 in Bangkok, uh, as well as potentially in some continental federation elections, there has been uh, vote buying or vote fraud. Um, and that takes a, a couple of different forms in, in the report, but the primary allegation is that votes were incentivized or bought uh, with cash between five and $30,000 um, per uh, person. Um, so the there isn't too many names in the report. Only one current executive board member, I believe, is actually named in the report, aside from uh, Cheyenne. Uh, which it will be clear that that person should not participate in um, in discussions around what the next steps on, on this particular subject. Um, and that's in the report. It's, it's Major General Interact Yob Tui of Thailand. Um, and what it alleges is that uh, members of, of two federations in particular, the, the Asian and African federations um, and Oceania, uh, potentially uh, in um, in 2013, uh, were potentially involved in 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 some sort of scheme uh, to arrange their votes. Um, 
to to reelect uh, Thomas Ryan. It, it's a complex situation because the IWF's governance that's now dealing with this, um, with the fallout of this, is is was potentially some of these individuals in involved in these yeah. election frauds. And only one name you you mentioned one name that was named specifically in the report, but it seems like it's a little bit of a game of clue right now in that we assume that there were more individuals involved. We assume some of them may still be involved in IWF govern governance uh, at the executive board level, uh, but we're not sure who. Is this a situation where, I mean, is there any, is it even possible for uh the executive board of the IWF to be kind of washed clean and, and reelected from scratch? Is that even, is that something that's at all in the books or a possibility? I'm not sure. Uh, and again, this is for the IWF and its executive board to decide. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm really doing this podcast as, as me, mm -hmm. um, right. as, as, because you know, I'm not speaking here on behalf of the IWF. Um, but it's up to them to decide what that looks like um, and how that goes forward. Should elections occur earlier rather than later as a result of, of the allegations to try and restore trust? And if so, what do those elections look like? What does a in potential investigation into the matters look like? So it, it's, it, it's I, I'm sorry not to give you a, a straight answer. I desperately want to uh, because I'd like that answer myself. But it, it's is simply the case that the executive board itself will decide those. And of course, there are likely to be people on the executive board who did not engage in that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, even the report essentially says that there are some who had full knowledge of, of a scheme and some who didn't. Um, and as a result, I think those who didn't, you know, may feel that they may wish to stand again, or even some of those who who did may wish to stand again too but obviously that that's a, a different issue um but it, it's it is up to the eb now to decide how to go forward and how to resolve those claims how to investigate those claims uh clearly that there is cause for for them to do so but what that actually looks like comes down to their decision among international among national federations and national governing bodies uh in the sport of weightlifting. And again, you can't speak for everyone. I certainly understand no. that. Um, you are the CEO of USA weightlifting, but you you know, you can't speak for every other head of every other national governing body. Uh, but generally, do you think this has basically ruined the credibility of the IWF executive board, particularly the voting fraud allegations from the perspective of some national governing bodies? Um, potentially so. Um, there has there's been statements made by New Zealand, uh, Great Britain, um, and the United States USA Weightlifting um, that I've seen, and I'm sure others have also commented. I think Germany may have done. Um, and of course, one of the issues is a lack of information for the executive board, but also a lack of oversight from the executive board comes out in the report. Uh, and I think that's where. At uh, very least, I read Great Britain's statement moments before this call, and that seemed to be where they were directing um, their um, issue, if you like, about the, um, the the current state of affairs was uh, the lack of oversight of, of Dr. Tamar Shayan and, and um, uh, indeed the lack of oversight of the IWF uh, as a whole. When, and there's two sides to that as the report comes out. There's Dr. Shayan's inability or lack of desire to give the executive board the information they need, but also, on the other hand, the executive board needs to have that oversight. Um, and indeed, the executive board has to be trusted by those member federations to give the oversight to the organization. The same as in the US, our board is trusted to give oversight to me and to our staff. Um, that has to be resolved. I think it's clear that there is a lack of trust right now between um, the whole international weightlifting community. I think that's fair. And I think that trust has to be rebuilt. And I think that's going to take more than just one thing. I don't think it's necessarily going to take uh, wiping the executive board, but it is going to take government's reform. Mm -hmm. um, as in, some people might return from the same executive board, some people might not um, in, in an election. Um, some people may, you know, and that's one issue that has to be addressed before I think any election can take place, is how are we going to make sure that the governance of the federation at its core is there? 
Mm. Um, and that governance allows fair elections, allows the right people to be elected to be supported by those member federations into those roles, and subsequently allows the executive board the right powers to oversee the president, the general secretary, and the CEO of the organization, and subsequently the staff. How do we modernize the sport to be the sport appropriate to manage this sport now? I think that's the real question, rather than specifically, do we wipe the executive board? Do we, how are member federations reacting? I think there's a degree of shock this morning. You know, we're one day out, as I mentioned, from getting the report. Um, there's a degree of what do we do now? What's the reaction? Many of the questions you've asked, David, is, is, is along those lines. Mm -hmm. um, I think a lack of trust generally amongst the IWF um, is probably the current state of play. And I think that is the core issue that we need to address. And that's primarily addressed in good government. I want to shift focus a little bit to talk about uh, doping in weightlifting. Now, it's worth noting that uh, well, the, the executive summary of McLaren's report said a few interesting things. Uh, it did say, it did reference that uh, Dr. Ion, and I quote, impermissibly interfered with the IWF Anti-Doping Commission. It referred to his behavior as meddling. Um, however, it did effectively clear Hunado, a uh, Hungarian yeah. National Anti-Doping Association organization, apologies, of any wrongdoing, as we referenced earlier in the call. Uh, and this is actually what stuck out to me most of this section of the executive summary of the report. And McLaren's team found that the real problem is the culture of doping that exists in the sport. And I'm quoting that verbatim. Obviously, weightlifting has had a number of issues regarding doping findings, retests from the Beijing and London Olympic Games made international headlines. What steps are being taken right now? And what steps do you think additionally need to be taken at the international level regarding doping testing and doping control in the sport of weightlifting? So I think what's interesting is this is probably an area which has been addressed relatively well since 2017. I'm not saying there isn't more work to do. There absolutely is. Um, and I'm a big proponent of that, of what more can we do? What, how else can we attack this problem? Um, and in 2017, we were threatened with elimination from the Olympic Games because of our widespread doping problem. But what happened was, and, and you have to give credit where credit is due, that Dr. Tavashayan appointed uh, what became the Clean Sport Commission headed by uh, Richard Young. Richard Young was the co-author of the WADA Code. And much like Richard McLaren, part of that agreement was the report of the Clean Sport Commission was free from interference, and literally you can't even change the letterhead. It's got to be on white paper that, that Richard provided. That provided a number of recommendations, uh, the perhaps most relevant of which um, was, the, uh, was the outsourcing of the out of competition and in-competition uh, testing arrangements to the International Testing Agency, which is actually set up by the IOC and led by a gentleman named Benjamin Cohen, who's previously with, with WADA. Um, that has occurred and was completed in 2019, uh, the full handover, so they look after results management. So some of the issues that were talked about, about potential manipulation of results management are now, I can't say impossible, because of course there may be issues at the ITA and that could be true of any organization. I'm not alleging anything about the ITA, but I will say much less likely because now there is an, yet another association and an independent one involved in, uh, in that process. Uh, they also look after the selection of out-of-competition testing um, and the selection of in-competition testing and the appointment of those uh, NADOs. So what happens is testing order is given by the results authority or the testing authority, which is now the ITA on behalf of the IWF, to a testing agency, which might be USADA, it might be UNADO, it might be um, UKAD or whomever, and they go and test that individual. It doesn't need to be the country necessarily where they're testing, um, so, you know, but because the order comes from the ITA. Uh, but that's the WADA, ITA, um, USADA, UKAD, et cetera, how that works. Um, and I think that's a critical step that gives a lot more trust to the process for everybody. Mm -hmm. um, the IWF recently outsourced appointing all of the panels, the Anti-Doping Commission of the IWF, as well as the Independent Member Federation Sanctioning Panel, which 
perhaps most famously has dealt with the Thailand case and the Egypt case in recent years. Um, all of those appointments will now be made by the ITA, not by the IWF. So all of that builds trust, builds independence into the anti-doping system. One thing that the IWF has has worked on recently is making sure that uh, the ITA is educated on weightlifting because they look after, much like USADA does, a lot of different Olympic sports. So mm -hmm. the downside of that is theoretically why an international federation is good at looking after or is appropriate to look after its own doping control program is because they know the sport. They know why a weightlifter might dope. They know when a weightlifter might dope right. and they understand mm -hmm. those risks. So, um, you know, one of the things that the ITA does need support and education on, especially as they, the first three, four, five years is when is exactly that. How does a weightlifter effectively engage in doping? How does, when does a weightlifter engage in doping and in which countries and why? What's the incentive behind that doping um, that they may engage in and therefore use the pool of money that we have out there for testing, which is a very significant portion of the IDRF's budget to test effectively. They're also in charge of education and they've done a pretty good job of that during coronavirus. Now, it's, it's a tough time to talk about doping control because doping control is slowed around the world. Uh, due to coronavirus, and that that has uh, not just for weightlifting, but for every sport, but testing, you're arguably backwards. Education is still there. A lot of people aren't training, so that lessens the risk a little bit. But it's clear that the I, the ITA, together with other anti-doping partners around the world, must aggressively test and aggressively get back into the swing of of uh, doping control after um, we've. Um, completed, if you like, or as soon as it's relatively possible to leave the house and, and go and test those people, I think is, is, is reasonable. Um, so a lot of that's been dealt with, but at the same time, that is not an area the IWF can say, well, look, we've solved that problem. We've got other allegations coming up that we need to solve. Yes, that's true, but antidoping is still our biggest core issue that we need to look at um, in our sport. And that's the one that I think from what I understand, athletes most care about is when I step onto the field of play, when I step onto the platform, do I have a fair shot against him or her that I'm competing against? And I think that's where I hear from athletes, certainly American athletes, is where they care about the most. And I, I think that's not just true of Americans. I think that's true worldwide. And one of the other things culturally that Richard mentioned that I think is worth, worth talking about is as you see less countries engaging in that, there'll be less of a sense of, well, we have to do it because they're doing it. Um, and, and that is an issue right now. That, um, and that's, that's in many research studies, not just in weightlifting, but in other sports, that's been shown to be a clear motivator for doping is, well, if I don't, the other six or seven guys that I'm up against or, or girls that I'm up against are engaging in that. And therefore, I have to if I wish to catch up. Um, and that's, and that's, I think, being part of the issue that we've had is that countries and individuals have, been, have looked at that and said, well, wait a minute, we can either finish 15th or, well, we can do the same as what they're doing. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, if you think about it from a very logical standpoint, perhaps you can understand some of that thinking. Um, so there are cultural issues. Education is critical. But we have to be aggressive in education. We have to be educate on what's happening now with doping control because that mitigates some of those issues that we talked about, about, well, if they're doing it, I can do it. Um, and we have to continue to go, all right, what more can we do? Can we do this cheaper and better, which means we can test more? Is there ways out there we can improve the way that we identify people to test? Is there, you know, all of those things come together for a good doping control program. But I will say... I do believe that's an area the IWF has significantly improved 2017 till now. We've talked a lot about the allegations in this report, some things that the IWF has made progress on, specifically in regard to anti-doping, and also some things where, as you referenced, we just don't know next steps because the report is so fresh. We're literally talking about 24 hours after this report came out, less than 24 hours after a lot of us have read it kind of front to cover. So, uh, you know, there are a lot of still unknowns moving forward and a lot of unknown next steps. And, and right now, you know, my best guess is as good as the next person's in regard yeah. to how a lot of these allegations or how this report will actually change the governance of the sport of weightlifting at an international level. Something that we do have 
a better grasp of and something that uh, I know that you can speak to with a little bit more confidence on specifics is the Olympic qualify is how the Olympic qualifying procedures for the 2020 Tokyo Olympics are still calling it the 2020 Olympics. It's or Tokyo 2020. It's really Tokyo 2021 now. A, a bit of a branding nightmare, if you ask me. Uh, but qualification procedures uh, for the Olympics that will occur in summer of 2021 in Tokyo. That's something that is not covered in McLaren's report. It's kind of no. outside. It's it's outside of the the realm of of the allegations raised in the Lord of the Lifters documentary. But I think it is still worth talking about because it's highly relevant to the sport of weightlifting at the international yep. level and highly relevant to especially um, a lot of American listeners, which makes up the majority of the listenership of this podcast. For now, we're getting more international. Right. So if you don't mind, Phil, walk us through the updates to the Olympic qualifying procedures for 2021. I know a big question that's been brought up is, hey, athletes who are already qualified for the Olympics, do they have to re-earn their spots? They've already put in all of this work over the last, you know, 24, 36 months. Um, are there spots at risk of being lost? You know, how does this impact Olympic qualifying procedure for weightlifters? It, it, it's it's to, to explain this really briefly, and 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 you know, this is I think an area where the IWF has got it generally right um, of of having six qualifiers, making people show up for doping testing um, more often, uh, and has been held up as the uh, an example of anti doping uh, reform. The particular qualification system, um, uh, uh, which is relevant to the last question. So it, it, it's this is an area where I think the IWF has actually done a good job over the last few years. Um, you know, there's some, certainly some questions on how this might work in the next quad and, and whether the point system might make sense, but that's, that's next quad. So the first thing to say is the IOC said international federations must use something that's essentially the same as what you've seen before. You can change the dates, but that's about it. And we were in a position where the last events that went ahead was the Manuel Suarez tournament in Cuba and the Arnold Festival in Columbus, Ohio, USA, um, which, of course, you know, for this, read barben.com for what happened there. Um, <laughs> so it is, um, but it was the, the, those two over the same period of time, and, and they were the last Olympic qualification events that happened. So what they've said is, okay, we're going to stop there, and then we're going to have a period 3B. So it used to be period 1, period 2, period 3. Now it's period 1, period 2, period 3A, and period 3B. And that will occur from October 1 to April 30. And you will be able to compete in just those uh, events that were canceled. So one Pan American Championship, and in our case, the Ebo American Championship in Colombia, which is due to happen in October. And uh, potentially, if it is rearranged, the 2020 Junior World Championships. Just because an event occurs in that period doesn't mean it counts. Only those that were already arranged in March and April of this year that were canceled. Um, now, the one nuance to that is that you have to show up in those events. So someone like CJ Cummings or Kate Nye had six events who had satisfied all their criteria, well-ranked, didn't necessarily need to show up at the Pan Ams. Kate was planning to, uh, well, no, I think Kate did withdraw. CJ had turned down his invitation, but he was planning to go to the junior world. Um, but theoretically, neither had to lift again. So uh, those two, for example, now do need to go and compete at least once during that period, 3B. Um, so you know, to, everyone stays where they were. If you, if you score points even at the Arnold or Cuba, you get those points. And in period 3B, you don't have to score, but you have to show up. So it's still best from your period one, the best from your period two, and the best from 3A or 3B, right. and then your next best. So theoretically, you could take two from this coming period if you're able to put up those totals. So you say, you said they have to show up and compete. You give the the examples of, of Kate and I and CJ Cummings, two lifters who I know the Olympic team has not officially announced yet for USA weightlifting, but two lifters very likely to qualify for the Tokyo Olympics. You say you show up and compete. Really, they just need to go through doping controls. They need to weigh in. They don't actually need to, if they, as long as they've posted a total in 3A that they're happy yeah. to use, they don't actually need to post a total in 3B. Uh, theoretically correct. You could show up, wave to the crowd, and, and leave, according to the IWF procedure. So you have to make yourself eligible for doping control. And you've seen that in world championships, and, and certainly in Grand Prix and lesser championships where people have just shown up and, and waved off their um, signed out of the competition. 
um, immediately after the introductions. It is worth critically saying that that is the IWS procedure. If we have more than four in any one gender, the nation decides. Mm -hmm. And what's happening now is the USOPC, United States Olympic Committee, who own that procedure and us are working through that uh, with the hope of in the next couple of weeks we'll have that published uh, to, to American athletes. So relevant to, uh, and again, I'm only speaking to the U.S. team here. Um, you're not going to necessarily know uh, the exact uh, selection timing for Spain or Great Britain or Brazil. Um, you may, you talk to a lot of people. Uh, <laughs> when will we know the United States Olympic team for Tokyo in weightlifting? Uh, and I do apologize, I don't have it up in front of me, but the IWF procedure actually does de denote those dates. Okay. Um, so when the uh, National Olympic Committees have to give those names to, um, the, uh, to the, the IWF and when the, how reallocation works, and I believe we essentially know the final roster on, on May 29, if I remember correctly. We, the I, I, the, I, if I apologize, the USOPC, generally is comfortable to announce someone as um, on the road to Tokyo. And it, you're technically not Olympian until you step on the field of play, so it's a very technical term. But they are generally comfortable to announce somebody as going to Tokyo when it's mathematically impossible for them not to go. So in other words, the, we should be in a position to announce that team on April 30th, which is the final day of the qualification, or, or May 1 of, of next year. Um, where it's mathematically impossible for anybody to eliminate them from the competition. Gotcha. So this is something I know that uh, we had had chatted uh, a lot about, and we heard a lot of questions from readers on, um, you know, when in 2020 are we going to know the 2020 Olympian weightlifters or those on the road to Tokyo for, for uh, the United States and for USA weightlifting? This is just to confirm for folks listening in, technically, you're going to have to wait until next spring to figure out who the team's going to be. Yeah, that's right. It's, it's next spring before we can say, here's your ticket to Tokyo and, and, and announce it in any way. Um, and the end of May is when the IWF roster becomes more solidified. So the weightlifting fans are not just interested in the U.S., but you know, interested in, right. well, who's China sending and, and who's Brazil sending. And it's, um, that's, that's when you're going to know who, not only the U.S., but who our opponents are. Um, so it, it's going to be exciting. Um, I, you know, I do think that the IWF has made a, a reasonable decision. I think uh, that or saying, well, we did say they would end in March, so we're going to keep with that. I do think in the context of having people show up for doping control, it makes sense. I think it's a fair way forward of saying, you know, we have um, just the cancelled events. I think that makes sense. Um, and of course, the, that might change who goes to the Olympic Games because there's opportunities now that didn't exist and injuries that may occur and injuries that did occur that may now be recovered from. Um, and I think those are, it's going to make it interesting watching and I don't know about anybody else, but I'm quite excited to see some international weightlifting eventually. Well, Phil, that's really what I wanted to cover today. It was a, a lot to cover, actually. I'm kind yeah. of surprised we fit it all in into this podcast, and, and we could talk literally for hours more about either subject, Olympic qualification procedure or uh, the revised Olympic qualification procedure or the McLaren report. I do appreciate you taking the time to dive into these topics today. And again, it is worth giving a little bit of additional context for folks listening in. There is still There are some known unknowns, and there are some unknown unknowns, specifically in regard to next steps for the International Weightlifting Federation. And you could call it the fallout, you could call it the impact of uh, Richard McLaren's report. So still uh, a, a lot that we will gain context uh, with, I'm sure, over the coming weeks, months, and, and even years and into the next Olympic quad, so to speak. So we'll keep readers and listeners updated as best we can on barbin.com. But Phil, uh, I always ask, where's the best place for people to keep up to date with the uh, work you're doing? And I say content you're pushing out because you're doing a lot more writing, it seems, these days, official statements and things like yeah. that. Yeah, it's, it's been relevant for us, uh, certainly in the United States, to comment on, on what's happening on social justice. Uh, June is a month we typically, uh, you know, we led the uh, NGBs in, in being the first to celebrate Pride, and now uh, a vast majority do. Uh, and of course, this June, I think there's a, a very serious social justice conversation to be had, um, particularly around the, the, the 
uh, treatment of, of African Americans in this country. And I, I don't want to prolong our time here, but uh, we we felt we could not stand on the sidelines uh, for that. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, so certainly we're doing a little bit more. I've been very lucky to have uh, various different people reach out to ask about what we're doing in COVID-19, where US everything has generally done relatively well, all things considered. Um, considering we are a sport organization with no sport going on, we've, we've done better than most. That doesn't mean we've done great, it just means we've done better than most. Um, and uh, that's been a privilege to be able to comment on some of that and then share some of the good work we're doing. Of course, there is likely to be lots of work ahead, both domestically, um, in order to work through 20 and 21. Um, 21 being a year where, to be honest, it's going to be a challenge because we have two the World Championships and the Olympic Games, the Pan Ams and another Pan Ams, uh, and all of that's got to be funded. Um, and we don't know where the economy is going to be. So there's some, definitely some challenges ahead for us that we still have to address. And of course, you know, with my role with the IWF, however long that lasts, looks like it will be busier than it was um, based upon uh, yesterday's uh, or rather Thursday's information. Um, but, you know, I, I generally comment um, in, in, uh, on behalf of USA Weightlifting. I am the, the spokesperson generally for USA Weightlifting, whereas I am not for the IWF. And I want to be clear about that. Um, and, um, uh, but yeah, um, to your question, you follow me on Instagram on a.phil, um, or Twitter at, at Phil Andrews USA. Um, those are the best places to generally see those sorts of writing that you're talking about. Um, and people can get hold of me by email, phil.andrews at USA and I've always on podcasts give out my number two seven one nine two hundred sixty twenty, And I'm always happy to, to hear from members and, and take suggestions on board. Um, uh, of what we can see better uh, as USA weightlifting. I think that's particularly relevant right now. Thanks so much for joining us, Phil. No worries. Thanks.